My name is Eric, and I'm a software engineer at a startup in San Francisco. I hosted underground dinners out of my apartment for several years, and that sparked a serious interest in cooking. After a dinner event at a shotgun range, I got interested in going hunting myself, and that led to a full-on obsession with all manner of hunting, fishing, and foraging. My name is James, and I work in software in Silicon Valley. I grew up in the suburbs of San Jose, unaware of how close I was to the natural bounty of wild foods that the Bay Area has to offer. As an adult, a love of food and the desire to conserve our wild places motivates me to experience everything the outdoors has to offer. Our goal with this project is to show you that you don't need to be an expert or come from a long line of hunters to harvest wild foods. We met up with Tony from Rolling Oak Outfitters and headed to California wine country to some private land he has hunting permission on. Wild pigs are prevalent in the area due to ample food supply and low hunting pressure. It's big right there. Okay. So you see how it's like the grass is knocked down in between the trail? That's because their bellies rub. Okay. So like a deer will be a track, track, track. Pigs, you'll have a belly rub the whole way. Oh yeah, they run straight lines up hills. Yeah, and I've seen the belly like drags through, so that's what it's like, like. Like where they're coming up right here. What we'll do is we'll ease up here to get in these rocks. Then we can look at them, pick out the one we're gonna wanna shoot. So. You see a color you like? Because they're all, there's no piglets. Okay. Like those three black ones on that end, those are all like younger boars. Okay. Oh, I feel that wind out, it's coming up, hitting us inside the face now. Um, like this dark chocolate one in the front, that's a sow. That front left one? Yeah. And so is this black one on that edge. Okay. So it's whichever one you would like. Yeah, I mean, if one of those sows is yeah. going to be in the right. Uh -huh. Good eating ballpark? That sounds great. No, they're all, like everything down there is going to be good eating. Okay. Yeah, maybe that chocolate one on the left then. Okay. Yeah. So we're just going to ease up real slow right to here so we can get that fence cleared. And then uh, that'll put us at about 100 yards. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and put one in real quiet. So just ease it back real slow and then ease it forward real slow. Second one in from the right. Second one. The one that's broadside facing the left. Yeah, that's perfect. So whenever you're comfortable and she stopped, mm -hmm. go ahead. Wait for her to stop. She, they don't know we're here. And don't let her, so don't shoot her because she's near that other yeah. one. Let her turn. Whenever you want. Hit. Yeah. Just watch her. Really good hit. Stumbling. Yeah. Gonna be some good meat. Yeah. That's great, man. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good shot. <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah, you hit her perfect right behind the shoulder. Nice. Yeah. She's all done. Cool. You want to walk down and put hands on her? Yeah, that's it. All right. Oh, that's quick. <laughs> yeah, I thought with the rain that we were going to have to work a little harder for it. Uh, it's just like they said, when the weather breaks. Yeah, when they show up, they show up. There's your pig right there, Eric. Yep. All right. That's gonna be some good eating. I estimate. She's probably 170. 
on the hoof. Do you think? Oh wow. Yeah. Cool. And she will eat really, really well. Nice. I don't know, man. Just grateful. Feels good. Come out, get it, get it done. <laughs> Literally first light, first morning. So get her broken down and get her home into the freezer. Thanks, old gal. You will not go to waste. <laughs> yeah, this is like, this feels considerably bigger than the one that I, the other one I shot. Yeah. She's in good shape. Yeah. All right, so come down to about the brisket. So you just cut through the meat here. Mm -hmm. And then you can flip the blade over and you just keep cool. it underneath and come right to you. Cool. And go all the way back to the tail. Perfect. And so you can you can just cut yeah lengthwise just like that. All right. Cool. So back to the truck. Back to the truck. Sweet. We'll come out and pick her up. Yeah. Feels a little heavier than she looks, huh? Yeah. yeah. When you get moving her. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like dragging an anvil. I'm glad you had these handles. Yeah. <laughs> Not all hunts go this smoothly, but it was a gratifying morning despite being such a quick hunt. We're heading back to Tony's to process the meat and get it into the cooler for the drive home. Ready to get this thing uh, unzipped and parted out so I can uh, get it cooled down. Ready to cook. Excited about the nice thick layer of fat we got on her. So it's gonna be good eating. And uh, yeah, hopefully get some, some nice jowls, maybe some belly off of it that is a bacon possible. A lot of, a lot of wild pigs are not uh, fat enough in the belly to actually make like decent bacon with. So it's uh, pretty exciting that we have a possibility at least uh, of that happening. Tenderloin time, baby. So this would be on a cow, like the eye of the ribeye. That's good, eating. That's gonna be uh, one where there's not that much of it, so it tends to be like the hunter special. Like, yeah. There's not even enough to really like share with people most of the time, Yeah, that's unless what, it's elk or bigger. It's one of the cuts that when you're in the field, you do not hang because you lose about half of it by letting <laughs> it age. A lot of these bones that he's trimming stuff away from, we'll, we'll still keep and put, uh, Put in the stock pot, make some good broth. Some bone broth, if you will. I will not. <laughs> yeah, that ball joint. It's a hard shape for nature to make. This is a whole, whole ham minus the little, little hoof. But uh, yeah, we'll probably uh, I think we're gonna leave these bone in and do them probably in the smoker or uh, maybe just a nice roast. Put that on the grill. Lots of, lots of fun ways you can go with that. And now we will do some ribs. This is normally what would be really good for sausage making, but Tony was saying that the uh, wild pig fat is way softer, and so it doesn't uh, perform as well as normal pig back fat, you know, farmed pig back fat would in a, in a sausage. Dope. Okay. So that is our rack of ribs. So we'll probably do some bacon with this this layer up here, you can see is real nice. Clean off some of that hair, and then we will smoke those ribs. Oh, that's, that's heavier now. Yeah, it's got some <laughs> stuff in it, it turns mm -hmm. out. <laughs> Coolers get heavy quick. Yeah. Dope. Sweet. We got back from the trip, and James and I butchered the pig and uh, got it into vacuum bags and put it in the freezer. Uh, it's a couple weeks later now, um, we thawed out some of those bags and we're going to turn them into sausage. So uh, this is a bag of pork shoulder that James did a lovely labeling job on. We're going to uh, cut it open and turn it into sausage. So there we go, and that's looking good, so we are ready to rock. So the stuff that we're happy about here is this uh, relatively hard fat, um, so we're going to we're gonna keep that, that's, that's good stuff. Um, the stuff that we're not happy about is anything that's 
harder or more chewy, um, stuff that won't necessarily grind up very well or turn into pretty sausage. So when you're cutting this up, you're looking for uh, cutting into the chunks that will fit into your meat grinder. Um, for most meat grinders, that means you want, you know, one inch cubes roughly, but uh, depending on the quality, it can be a little uh, larger or a little smaller. Make sure your meat, when you're working with it, is uh, cold. You don't want it to ever get to room temperature because that's not safe. It's very important to have a sharp knife for this work. Um, it's, it's easy to, when working with oddly shaped cuts like this, uh, to accidentally cut yourself if you're not uh, applying pressure with a sharp knife in a consistent way. So wild animals have to work a lot harder than farm-raised animals do, so the connective tissue can be uh, a lot more dense and tough and that can lead to a sausage that has a little too much chew in it for my taste. So I tend to try and take out as much as I can. Um, this animal in particular was a relatively young one, and so it hadn't quite developed a lot of the tougher connective tissues that you'll see in older animals. So you can see this all looks pretty similar to pork you'd buy at the, the grocery store. The, uh, the meat around the, the entrance and exit wounds However, it does not. It looks uh, very bloody, and it uh, is not an appealing look, but it also is not a delicious uh, meat. So what you're going to want to do is be fairly aggressive when trimming off that bloodshot meat. Uh, it is not good eats. So this meat that I'm cutting up is from the pork shoulder. It's a very popular cut for making sausage around the world. The qualities that make it good for sausage making is that it has a lot of intramuscular fat. So it retains its moisture because of all the fat that's integrated into the meat. With this pig, we're gonna make some uh, Italian sausage. The area that the, the pig was living in has a lot of wild fennel, so the, uh, the pairing there seems like a natural where, where did the food come from thing. The flavor of wild pork also just, I think, pairs very well with a, a fennel, and partially spicy Italian sausage is, is one of my personal favorites. After you're done cutting up the meat, you want to get it onto a sheet pan and get it into the freezer. For, for the best freezing distribution, you want there to be a single layer of meat, so you can get it sort of laid out on the, on the sheet pan and just make sure it's even so that you get sort of even freezing across the whole sheet. The stuff in the middle will not freeze as quickly, so you want to have a little bit looser distribution in the middle and a little bit denser distribution towards the edges because this part will freeze faster, and this part will freeze slower. Once you get it all on a sheet pan, just pop it in the freezer for one, probably minimum of one hour. If you've got a dedicated grinder, it should be able to handle it no problem. If you're working with a KitchenAid, stick to an hour, maybe two. And into the freezer we go after I wash my hands. Cool, so we're making sausage. So we're gonna load some meat into the hopper here. The meat needs to be semi-frozen, ideally. You want it to be very, very cold and semi-solid. Uh, and then you wanna mix in some of the hard fat, which is gonna be completely frozen, uh, to make sure it doesn't smear at all. Obviously, you've weighed out your portions of both of these beforehand. It's very important that you have an even mix. And that the ratio is correct. Mm -hmm. Or at least what you're shooting for. You can do any batch size you want as long as the ratios are on. Cool. So we got our hopper loaded up here with some meat and some fat. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the... Why don't you do that since my hands are all <laughs> meaty? Okay. Uh, towards you. Towards me. Here we go. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and all right. pry it on in. Here. Oh, so I turn it off. Yep. Okay. And gonna give that a chance to fall off, or just knock it off. There we go. Knock it off. Not, not. <laughs> knock it off. Okay. Knock it off. I'm gonna turn this back on just so I don't have to listen to you. Yeah, that's a fair, fair move. Sweet. 
So wait for that last little bit to go through and then we're good to go. Now that you've got the meat and fat all ground up together, you want to mix in your seasonings. If your seasonings aren't pre-measured out at this point, you, what you want to do is make sure that the, the meat grind stays super cold. So back in the fridge at the bare minimum and ideally in a bowl of ice as well. But since our seasonings are ready to go, we can just uh, skip right to the mixing. You want to talk about what kind of seasoning we have here? Yeah, it's a, a fennel, sort of a fennel heavy pork sausage, uh, just classic Italian, semi spicy, not, not too crazy. Wanted it to be accessible, but still have some zip. Uh, so a lot of fennel, some chili flakes, cayenne pepper, coriander, paprika. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. So do you want to gradually mix it in, or do you want to just kind of dump it and, and work it in there? Doesn't, I don't think it really matters. You're just looking for an even distribution. Uh, lost in the sauce. That's flavor town. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the grind looks good. We don't have a lot of smearing, which is what you're looking for. You can see there's nice, uh, nice even breaks between, between the fat and the meat section. And you can see that's the case in most of these pieces as well. Now we're going to mix in our seasonings, our dry seasonings. So James has already added the liquids. Now we're going to add in the dry and then combine and get our hands really cold. You ready? Yeah, hit it. Yeah, give me like a third. Yeah, that's good. That's and good then, start. Yeah, and we'll, we'll cool. get it turned over. And This is definitely one of those situations where it's nice to have at least two people because your hands will get very cold. It's also nice to have a bigger bowl. Yeah. Yeah, this is about as much sausage as I, as I would want to make in this bowl. So you can see at this point, the all of the liquid that we added is integrated. There's not any hiding out in the bottom of the bowl. It's all absorbed spices and distributed itself through the meat, which is what you want. I think we're good? Yeah, I think that's good to go. It's looking nice, huh? Looking nice. So before we actually finish stuffing, we should probably make sure this is gonna taste good. So we're gonna start with a test patty and fry it up real quick and see how it tastes. So when you're uh, forming this, you want to make sure it's relatively thin. Uh, sausage is, takes a surprisingly long time to cook, and you're not looking for any like caramelization here. You're really just looking for get it cooked to a safe temperature and see how it tastes. With most sausage you're making, there's going to be enough fat in here that you don't really need to add any fat to the pan. So just pop it in a pan on sort of low to medium and give it a few minutes to cook, flip it, give it another few minutes, and taste. So we're gonna give it a little flip here. Oh yeah, that's looking tasty. All right. So he wasn't going for any caramelization, but that's a happy little accident right there. Okay, let's pull this off now. Excellent plating, obviously. Totes. Right in the middle of the circle, James. I did it. Killer job. Yep. Cooked fine, as you can see. Yeah, that was great. Yep. Cool. Yeah, let's case it. So this is a five pound cylinder sausage stuffer. So as you can see, it's already starting to cool down from the meat that we've added to it. When you're adding meat to a cylindrical sausage stuffer, you want to make sure that you are pressing out any air pockets as you go. So you add, you know, a nice healthy handful of meat and sort of press it down with your fingers to make sure it is relatively flush with the meat below it. If you don't get those air pockets out, you're gonna blow your sausage up when you're cooking and get oil everywhere, and you're gonna burn yourself, and it's gonna be bad for everybody. Everybody. All right, so this guy is now relatively full, and we're gonna start actually stuffing some sausage. So we've got the sausage stuffer all set up, and we're going to uh, get our sausage casings ready to go. The important thing here is not to attach the sausage casings to the stuffer immediately. You actually want to stuff some of the meat out through this tube so that there's no big air pocket created inside the casings. So go ahead and... Crank it. Oh, slow. Yep. Yep, keep on going. 
and yeah, that's good. These casings come with a handy dandy threader mechanism. So this uh, blue thing is helpful for making sure you get the casings all the way onto your sausage stuffer tube. These are natural hog casings. I, I prefer them primarily because they're very durable. So a lot of uh, synthetic sausage casings and even some other animal sausage casings are very easy to break. And when you're making sausage, it's the most annoying thing that could possibly happen to you. Natural pork casings like this are also gonna give you a great snap to your sausage that you really don't get from these synthetic sausages. Oh, snap. Oh, snap indeed. If you feel the need to make a phallic joke at this point. Oh, this is prime dick joke territory right here. Full of your heart. Cool, so you do wanna leave a little bit at the end here, but we are, like I said, we're going to try and squeeze out as much of the air bubble situation as possible. Don't worry if there are some, because you're going to go through and poke them out later, but for now, we're just gonna tie a simple, simple knot there, and we're off to the races. So, I like to have a sheet, sheet pan underneath. It makes it easier to, to keep the coil going, so. Let's, uh, let's right. go, James, yeah. Right. So it's helpful to have two people here, but not 100% necessary. Done it by myself, it's just a bit more of a pain in the ass. You have to attend to both sides of the equation a little more. What you're looking for here is full, but not like crazy tight, because you want to be able to twist this into links after the fact. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and tie this off and cut this so that we don't have a ridiculously unwieldy situation. A ridiculously unwieldy sausage? Sure. Cool, so now we've got our sausage. This is just half of the batch that we are making today, but we'll go ahead and show you linking. So basically, you can choose to make as small or as large of a link as you'd like. You just sort of pick the point you want. I'm going for sort of a traditional, we're gonna put this in a bun and have sort of a cookout with it. So you know, in, the, in the five to six inch ballpark, you just give it a twist and then make sure you remember which direction you twist it in because you're gonna go the opposite direction on the next sausage. Inevitably, you will forget. <laughs> it's great. Why do you uh, go the opposite way? Uh, because if you go the same way, then you do this, and you end up with a previous one on I see. on uh, twisted. So I fulfilled my own you prophecy in about four seconds. Yeah. And this is why I mentioned that you want to leave yourself some slack so that. Basically, you'll see how this is a little looser over here, so I'm gonna sort of squeeze that meat towards the link to sort of tighten it up. And making it a little looser when you start is a, an easy way to make sure that you have the flexibility to, to get the diameter that you're looking for. And then you can see that we have actually a fair number of air bubbles in here, but what we'll do here momentarily is actually pop those air bubbles and they will not be a problem anymore. Cool, so there we are. So after you get your sausages linked, there's two steps that you need to go through. You need to prick out all these air holes so that they don't stay in the sausage. Then you're going to let it rest on this rack overnight in the fridge. That'll let uh, the casings seal back up and tighten around the meat so that you get a nice, firm, intact, non explodey sausage. Those are all technical terms. Totes. If you got a little pin, that's probably better, but I can't find my little pin, so you're just gonna try to make as tiny a little incision as you can in each of the holes. If it's a little bigger, it's not that end of the world. So if when you poke the hole, you can see the casing sort of tighten up around that air, previous air hole, that's what, that's what you're looking for. So once you've got most of your air bubbles out, 
you're pretty much ready to go. So we're gonna pop this in the fridge, uh, leave it overnight, and uh, they'll be ready to cook. So let's do that. Thanks for watching and uh, bon voyage. Wild foods are a unifying force in our lives. There's something special about getting your friends and family together and sharing something that you worked hard to kill, process, and cook. Meals like this one help us share our love of the outdoors with people who may never go hunting themselves. But the closer we can all get to our food, the better off we'll all be. If we can share our love of the outdoors at the kitchen table, we can get people to begin to see why we are so passionate about conservation, and inspire them to get excited about hunting, fishing, and foraging. Oh, it smells so dank. Ship it, ship it. Fall down. Hit me! <laughs> there's, there's enough for everybody to have two. I just cut them in half because the baguette was shaped and perfect. Sort of service. So the sausage is a semi-sweet, semi-hot Italian. Uh, so a lot of fennel, some chili flake, but not crazy on the chili flake. And then we, so we cased most of it, just got a little mustard on the bun, and then uh, used the uncased portion, mixed it in with some kale, uh, sherry vinegar, spices. Nice, come on. Shell, 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 shell. Salad, salad. at Source Wild <laughs> on all your social media platforms. Wherever good tweets are found. Bad tweets too, don't worry.